Welcome to the Midlife Fulfilled Podcast. Are you over 40 and ready to truly thrive? Well, on this podcast, we go deep on ways to thrive across the five pillars of midlife, health, fitness, career, relationships, and legacy. I'm Bernie Borges, midlife advocate, life coach, and your host. Subscribe now and get ready to thrive. Spence Wixom, welcome to the Midlife Fulfill Podcast, a Maximum episode. Hey, thanks, Bernie. It's so great to be here with you. It's great to have you. I am looking forward to our conversation. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, but I really want to hear your backstory, Spence. Uh, I'll just introduce you. Uh, you are the president and the CEO of the Brooks Group. Um, lead the organization to deliver transformational performance improving your clients' sales teams. So you're all about leading sales organizations. Uh, you've got a storied background. I'm sure we'll hear more about it. You've been with the CEB, Gartner, Challenger. Uh, and, you know, you've been at it for a long, long time. So why don't you tell us your backstory, Spence? Let's start with that. <laughs> sure. So long, long time ago in uh, university, I had this dream of being a lawyer. Um, well, actually, that, that's not true. My first dream was to be a playwright, but I was actually pretty bad at that and found that out very quickly in college as I took playwriting courses that that probably wasn't a good way to feed a family. So I decided as any English major does that I was going to go to law school. I did a uh, internship at the US Supreme Court. And what I realized in that internship was if this is about as good as law gets, I'd hate to see how bad it gets <laughs> for a guy like me. <laughs> but what was really interesting and I like to tell people that was my first sales job is I had the uh, opportunity to research the art that hung in the justices offices and then write briefs about that, that the justices could use when people showed up in their chambers and said, hey, what's this art that's hanging on your wall? Because they would get you know pieces of art on loan from the National Gallery. And so I was the guy in charge of writing these briefs uh, for the justices use. And what was fun about that was writing in a way to persuade them, basically selling the art to the justices, selling the backstory, selling the um, all of the emotion behind those pieces of art. Um, and I found that I was much better as a creative writer than, say, a legal technical writer. And so that made me interested in business and in particular sales and marketing. And so I got home from that internship, changed my direction, got into investment banking and real estate, uh, doing sales and marketing in those arenas. And then about 18 years ago, just happened upon uh, this ragtag team of researchers at Corporate Executive Board doing uh, global sales performance research. And we started out as a little unit and then we became a bigger unit. We got bigger and more interesting projects over the years, and we really grew that uh, practice into something special. That's where I spent a good amount of my career was in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then about a year and a half ago, uh, some individuals that I had known for a long, long time came to me saying, you know, there's this boutique sales training and transformation company. Uh, they're looking for a new CEO. And I saw in this just an opportunity to go back to the fundamentals and to really research and develop uh, what I like to call a handcrafted sales transformation initiative for organizations. Uh, we work with a lot of companies all over the world and a lot of different industries. Uh, we actually even work with the U.S. military, training military recruiters to improve their sales acumen, which is a real fulfilling part of my job. But that's really what I'm focused on right now is how do we research and then develop solutions for organizations that feel crafted and aligned to what they need to accomplish. And just so I'm clear, my listeners clear, you are referring to your role as a CEO at the Brooks Group. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, what I love about that, Spence, is that you have many years, decades of really approaching sales from the standpoint of a discipline that really requires structure. It's not Sales is not something that people just go wing and do it, right? Especially complex business to business selling. But anyway, I know that's not the purpose of, of this episode. Uh, 
you, your company, the, the, the Brooks group, you, um, you guys wrote a paper. Let me uh, bring it up here. And I reached out to you uh, on this because it really captured my attention. So, and of course we're going to share a link to it in, in the show notes. It's the uh, 2024 sales leader trend report, managing a multi-generational sales team. And I, I invited you into this episode to discuss kind of the, the four perspectives on work. And as you know, Spence, we discussed before I pressed record that we're not going to limit this to sales because I know, you know, that not every listener to the, to the Midlife of Hill podcast is in sales, but we're going to talk about the, the four sort of generations at work and, and how we, we need to understand them, embrace them and really set them up for success. So is that a good kind of segue to the conversation, Spence? That, that's a perfect segue. What, so what was so interesting about this study is we originally just wanted to understand some of the priorities and sales trends of B2B organizations today. So we went out and we studied about 150 of them. But there was a question that we asked around, what's the predominant generation in your sales organization? And of the four that are present in the workforce right now. And we got that data back and we started to cut all of our responses by that. And we started to notice some really interesting trends. And so that's what motivated this additional sales trends paper. But uh, what we're trying to do now, what we're trying to go deeper on is to really understand the nuance of our baby boomers, Gen X, uh, millennials or Gen Y and Gen Z all working together the same time. Let me give you a little bit of data here just to chalk the field. So as of right now, 2024, you've got baby boomers are about 14% of the workforce. Uh, Gen X, 33%, millennials, 35%, and Gen Z, 14%. So, you know, a good amount in each of those generations working together. Uh, what's interesting, of course, over the next uh, couple of years, we're going to see baby boomers go from about 14% down to 7%. Uh, then we'll see Gen Z go up to a little over 20%. Uh, but we'll still have representation of all those, those generations. And we're going to get to a point where Gen X, millennials, Gen Z are going to be somewhat kind of an equal portion of this uh, culturally diverse workforce. Now, we're recording this in the middle of 2024. And did I hear you say that millennials make up 35%? Uh, yeah, 35%. Okay, which is the biggest percentage, right? Uh, just a little larger than Gen X. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Gen X and millennials, 33 and 35 respectively. Okay, so pretty close. Pretty close. Okay. And one of the things that I, um, I want to point out, and I did mention this on a previous episode or two, and that is that the high end of the millennial age bracket is 43 years old, right? So millennials are now in that over, four, not exclusively or entirely, but millennials include up to age 43. But anyway, I digress a little bit. Let's talk about each each of the, the groups, right? Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, baby boomers. Uh, I know that uh, the in the white paper, you actually have some really key compelling points about each one of those age groups and what's important to them and really some advice on how to how to work with them. Yeah, so let's uh, let's dive into it. I think one of the first principles around this that's important to understand and we see this play out in the data, I'll share with you some trends that reinforce this idea. Uh, and this idea was taught to me by individuals who have studied this a lot longer than I have as I was sharing the data with them. You want to think about the various generations as call and response uh, reflections on one another. So let's start, for example, with baby boomers. Uh, baby boomers tend to be uh, community-oriented, collectivist. They like group orientation. What's interesting is when you look at Gen X, that next generation, they tend to be more individualistic, right? More um, kind of self or individual focused. So it's a the Gen X is a response to the baby boomers. Then when you get to millennials, they tend to move back toward that team, community, collective um, mentality. And then it moves back over uh, with Gen Z to that individualistic idea. And you know what's really interesting, Bernie, is you see this play out 
One of the best examples, I think, of this is when you look at the movies that define these generations. So let me list a couple of movies from each of the generations. And that does a lot to define who they are, what's important to them. So take uh, Baby Boomers, for example. Uh, the big movies that are always listed as Baby Boomer movies, The Graduate, Easy Rider, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? You think about those movies. What are they? What's the story that those movies are telling? It's all about a group of individuals coming together to create a counterculture, uh, to sort of unite together against what was the previous generation, right? That silent or greatest generation of, of individuals. Um, so you move to the Gen X movies. What are the Gen X movies that really define? Uh, Wall Street, Top Gun, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like, what are those movies about? An individual, a maverick, mm -hmm. a, you know, um, somebody bucking the system, figuring out a way to succeed individually. It's interesting because Wall Street, as an example, as a movie, you think about that the Bud Fox, the main character in that movie, a, a prototypical Gen Xer, right? Master of the universe, Wall Street broker, going to find his own way to the top of the mountain. And his dynamic against his father, Carl Fox, who is that like labor working man for Blue Sky Airlines, right? You kind of see the generational dynamic painted there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you move to millennials. What are the big movies with millennials? The Matrix, Fast and Furious, Social Network. Again, you're talking about groups. You're talking about these bands of people coming together to um, around a common cause and that's the interesting dynamic that you see new in millennials is it's it's a lot about purpose, cause, mission uh, that's presented there. Finally, the Gen Z movies, and quite honestly, I had to look these up, but these are not the movies that I would typically go see. You've got movies like Book Smart, The Hate You Give, Edge of 17. Again, very much individual movies. Yeah, again. I don't know any of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I have a question though, Spence. So- I'm going to name a movie and I'm going to ask you which age group, which generation does it fall under? Okay. My, my, my guess is probably going to be predominantly based on my knowledge of when it came out, but try me. Okay. Let's see. All right, here we go. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Weekend at Bernie's is a Gen X movie for sure. That's a Gen okay. X, movie. you know, it's like um, trying to, conquer the world by yourself doing some different thing right as far even going as far as pretending that your boss is dead right right yeah so what what does all of that tell us as leaders for anybody who's leading people in the workplace again we're not restricting this discussion to sales just leading people so um give us some guidance on how to understand what you're sharing in the context of leading people. Sure. Let, so let's look at, okay, so we're thinking about this call and response element and these different um, concepts in each generation, right? Some collectivist, some individualistic. Let's think about communication specifically. So if I'm a leader of a multi-generational sales team, let's think about the communication preferences of each of these generations. Let's start with the baby boomers face-to-face -face communication, deeper relationship. It's interesting. If you've gone to any conferences recently, like I was at a sales conference just this last week. A few weeks ago, I was at a conference as well. Guess who most of the audience is at those conferences? It's older Gen X individuals and baby boomer individuals. You very rarely see young people actively engaged in these conferences. Hmm. Yeah, uh, The yeah. boomers and the older Gen X, they like that face-to-face, -face, like deeper relationship communication. Generation X, email and text um, communication. So kind of starting into digital. Millennial, right. social, you know, connecting social networking, instant messaging, and then Gen Z video. You know, so when you think about like what kind of communication from the org or from a leader is going to engage these generations, you have to understand that each of them are going to prefer or engage differently with different kinds of communication. What about inspiration? How do you inspire a team of people that's multi-generational? So it's a good question. Let's, let's talk about some of the elements there. Um, I think with baby boomers, 
uh, let's talk about what kind of they, what they're looking for, right? What motivates them. And what's interesting is we do a lot of, we study thousands of salespeople every year and we measure their motivational profile. And what we have been seeing is some statistically significant changes in average motivational profiles as we've seen changes in generational weighting. And I think that indicates a lot to us what's going to inspire or motivate your workforce. But baby boomers very much motivated by team dedication. You know, are we in it as a team? Are we working together as a team? Are we all contributing together? Gen X is looking, they're very individualistic. So they're going to be motivated by recognition, accomplishment, and a to a certain degree, a balance of different accomplishment in life, right? I can do, I can succeed in work, but I'm also recognized at succeeding in certain things in my personal life. So individual recognition is going to be big for them. Millennials, it's all about mission and flexibility. Are you giving me the flexibility to like work as a team to accomplish some kind of purpose? Again, though, with millennials, it comes back to team and group as opposed to individual. And then um, Gen Z is all about, is this helping my brand? Is this creating purpose for me individually? Interesting. Okay, so that that puts a lot of pressure on a leader to understand all those dynamics. And certainly that's why I'm going to recommend anybody listening to this podcast to uh, to, to download this white paper, which again, we'll link up in the show notes. Uh, I'm staring at it during our conversation and I see the four quadrants of these four generations. So in, in the last question, you addressed the inspiration. What about sort of the other spectrum and that's conflict? How, how do leaders handle conflict across the, the these generations? Well, it, it, and it is interesting, right? Because that conflict will, to some degree, arise because of the different motivations mm -hmm. of the different groups, right? You've got some individuals in the organization who want to be very loyal to the organization and other groups in your organization who are more perhaps loyal to their own agenda or to their own accomplishment or to their own brand and purpose as opposed to the organization's brand and purpose. And so you have to find a little bit of something for everyone and find what everyone can kind of come together around. The other thing we have to recognize, Bernie, that was an interesting statistic that I found today is when you look at um, compared to 2010 to today, so the last 14 years, the degree of increase in personal anxiety among individuals, of course, is going up among individuals generally. And I think we have a more difficult economy. I think we have a more turbulent global environment. I think we have a pandemic that has created more isolation just generally among people. Uh, the breakdown of a lot of the social structure that people used to have and rely on is driving up anxiety, but it's driving it up differently for each of these generations. So for example, Gen X, um, levels of anxiety up 52%. Millennials up 103%. Gen Z up 139 percent, and so your your younger generations feeling more of this anxiety um, than your your older generations. Now, how do you kind of come together? Is I think a recognition of what others, based on the different generation they're a part of, are going through. Right, that greater empathy, that greater um, appreciation for differences? What can we learn from each other? How can we support one another as opposed to maybe like picking on one another or wishing one another were different than they are and things like that? We've got to find a way to appreciate the different benefits that each of these generations bring. Yeah. You know, a few episodes ago, uh, I did two back-to-back -back episodes on uh, the fact that millennials are experiencing life crises and they expect to actually experience a midlife crisis at a much younger age than traditional midlifers in our 40s and 50s. And one of the data points that really stuck out from the research that I did was that 64% of millennials said that um, they've already had a life crisis, 64%. Mm. And, and it just strikes me that um, 
they are like one of the other things that that I found in my research is that they struggle with the older generation. They feel like they're not understood. You know that Gen X and boom, boomers don't understand the millennials and the, the the pressures that they're facing. Now, in the research that I have just completed, and at the time of our recording and publishing this, and in June of 2024, or actually July, early July, uh, this report is not published yet. But I'll give you a little sneak preview, Spence, and that is that midlifers, so 40s, 50s, 60s, we get along with those younger than us. We work well. We think we work well with them, and we're totally willing to work with them. But there's data that shows that millennials feel like they're not well understood by all, those of us that are older. Are you seeing some of that? I, yeah, I am seeing some of that. And, and I think um, what's interesting is a lot of organizations right now talking about culture, right? They say we have to develop a strong culture. And sometimes that culture can be very limited to we want people who look and act and behave like us as part of the culture, which then tends to be a bunch of people of a very similar socioeconomic background, um, generational background, um, and people then tend to feel most comfortable, right? It's it's like in social situations, you tend to, we and this is an unfortunate thing, we feel most comfortable with people that are maybe a couple of years to one side of us or the other, right? Where there is so much we can learn and so our social lives, our work lives can be so much richer by exploring deeper relationships with people um, of different generations. I think the thing that um, the uh, baby boomers and the Gen X can potentially do, and hopefully uh, you can get millennials and, and Gen Z to be motivated by this as well, is to learn from each other's strengths, right? So right. the millennials and the Gen Z are very good at building efficient, large scale social networks or engaging with a lot of people being very kind of um, loud and dynamic. Um, the Gen X and uh, baby boomers are really good at developing deep relationships with people. I mean, some of, I think about some of my experiences and I've been very blessed to have them where I have learned from baby boomers who do such a great job of engaging people in such a deep um, and caring way. I, I share a story. I was backstage one time with Robert Gates, who was Obama's uh, secretary of defense. And I watched him baby boomer. I watched him engage uh, in his time there with this 12 year old little boy scout who was going to be part of the flag ceremony at this event and showing just undivided attention toward this young boy. And I learned just a tremendous amount from that because I think other generations would probably not approach that situation the same way Secretary Gates did. Um, and you can learn that by just observing, you know, the strengths of people in a generation above you or the strengths of people in a generation below you. Yeah. So as we get close to wrapping here, Spence, um, maybe you just alluded to it and, and I'll ask you to elaborate. And that's the, the leadership topic. W what's the impact that you're seeing at the leadership level across these four generations? Well, the impact that we're seeing is the leadership level is number one, changing because the, the dynamic is, um, as you had said before, more uh, Gen X are moving into senior executive roles in organizations, millennials are moving into managerial and leadership and executive roles. And so you're having new generations become leaders who need to then appreciate in many cases, um, as this kind of, as these younger generations start to, particularly those who are, you know, very upwardly mobile are moving into leadership roles. They're leading people older than them in a generation older than them. They're leading people in generations younger than them. And they need to find a way to make those connections uh, and to motivate, inspire, build relationships with people of all those different groups. Okay. So maybe to add to that, uh, a closing thought, you know, anyone listening to this, who's just thinking about the fact that, you know, they, they're exposed to these four generations, whether it's the workplace or outside the workplace, 
just a closing thought on how we can approach engaging, leading, being a part of these four generations. Yeah, I think, um, again, the, I think the most important thing, as I said earlier, and I'll just, I'll just say it again, is appreciating where each of them are coming from. It, we're all trying to, in any organization, we're trying to come together. We're trying to move toward a direction together. Um, what we have to appreciate is where everyone is starting from in coming together. And what they bring are both unique strengths and things that others have to have some empathy and understanding for. Um, so it, it isn't who people are. It's kind of where they're starting from on their journey together. And that's what really brings organizations together. It is not, in my estimation, as much a shared culture as we tend to define culture as you know people who like the same things I do and behave the same way I do. It's shared values. And if we have shared values and mission, and again, shared mission is something that these younger generations really appreciate and love and will get behind. And if we have shared values and mission and we recognize where each of these generations is starting from and the strengths that they bring as leaders, I think we can rally the organization together much better. Yeah. Well said, Spence. If I was to use one word to kind of encapsulate what you just closed with, and that's empathy, just having empathy for where everybody in your group is, where they're coming from and understanding the the shared values so that you can really maximize the relationship uh, and and when it's in a work environment maximize just you know the outcomes that you're all working on uh, together so fantastic yeah and well, look for the I'm sorry just the one thing I would add to that is look for the strengths right look for the virtues look for the positive things that each of these generations can contribute I, I mean, you take the baby boomers, for example, like we we have a fleeting amount of time to learn from them how they build relationships, deep relationships with people. We need to take advantage of that while we have the opportunity. Yep. Thank you for that extra point. And and by the way, I'm sure you know that uh, your, um, yours truly, the host of the Midlife Fulfill podcast is absolutely a baby boomer and <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> And I've enjoyed every bit of this conversation. Spence, where can people connect with you, learn more about you and what you've got going on at the Brooks Group? Yeah. So first of all, with me, I love to connect with folks on LinkedIn. So Spencer Wixom, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to connect. I'd love to have conversation. Folks, you can also email me, uh, S Wixom, S-W-I-X-O-M as in Mary at thebrooksgroup.com. And if you're interested in getting our research, uh, looking into some of the things we're working on, uh, thebrooksgroup.com is a great place to go. Fantastic. Well, I will have a link to that specific uh, white paper where people can get it uh, in the show notes for this episode. And Spence, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the Midlife Fulfilled Podcast, a maximum episode. This is a topic that I think is really, really relevant to uh, the listener of this podcast. So thank you so much for, for joining me today for this, this invigorating conversation. Thank you, Bernie. It was a great pleasure to be here. 